important thing is that you come. So come in what you have, and we'll go from there. It's our vision to be a beacon, a light, a celebration of hope, a hope that we can only find in Jesus. We only ask one thing. You've tried it your way. Why not give his way a try? church. church family. My name is Abby. Welcome to Tri-State Worship Center and thanks for being here. There's a lot happening at TSWC and so we wanted to take a few minutes and share a couple of things coming up for you and your family. So check this out. Is this your first time at TSWC? One of the best ways you can get connected with us is to text welcome to 740-224-8694. We have a small token of our appreciation for you being here. Regular attenders please text here to the same number and once again thanks for being here. One of the ways we try and spread the good news is through our live stream. Will you help us? Get your phone out, go to TSWC's Facebook page, and like and share the live stream. Such an easy way to extend the reach of TSWC. Tonight at 6 p.m. is our men's Bible study. The subject is Seven Challenges Men Encounter. Tonight's subject is Accept Responsibility. Come and join other men as they journey to being a godly man. Wednesday night we have classes for all ages, beginning at 7 p.m. Don't miss an opportunity for a midweek pick-me-up as we journey towards discipleship together. Thursday night at 6 p.m. is our ladies' Bible study. If you're looking to dive deeper in the Word while connecting with some other ladies in the church, here's your chance, Thursday at 6. Charles Spurgeon said, A prayerful church is a powerful church. Saturday at 7 p.m. is our weekly prayer time. Come and join us as we pray for our church, community, and world. Winterfest is in four days. We need your help. If you can donate food or money to buy food for our trip, please see Ryan or Holly. This will be a life-changing weekend for our students, and you can participate by helping us. Also, there will be a mandatory student parent meeting today, directly after second service. There will also be one last opportunity to come and pray for Winterfest. In the Journey Room, Tuesday, February 27th at 7 p.m. to pray for Winterfest. Marketplace Craft Show, March 23rd, our annual craft and vendor event for local artisans, including homemade clothing, candles, food items, home decor, jewelry, personalized items, and other specialty crafts. Make plans to come and shop, eat, and fellowship. TSWC VBS begins July 10th. We are starting the planning. We need volunteers. volunteers. That's exactly what I'm doing. What's with the binoculars and the cacaoing? Well, when you're bird watching, you don't want to just see any old bird, right? Yeah. I mean, I could go to the back of my porch and see just a sparrow or a blue jay. 
Sure, I guess that makes sense. But if I want to catch special birds, then I need a special call to catch them, right? Yeah, but how's that gonna help us find BBS volunteers? Well, we need special volunteers, okay? We need people who want to make the boys, the lives of the boys and girls better. And we want them to know about God's yes, Word. Absolutely, you're not wrong. We do need that. We need people who want to love our kids, who want to show them the, the love of Christ, who want to tell them biblical truth. But I'm so confused. How are bird calls and binoculars going to help us find okay, okay. BBS workers? But the thing is, look around, look around. It, it's set in the jungle, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. And jungles are sometimes part of the rainforest, right? Yeah. And You're just gonna have to get there. do you know what's in rainforests? Birds. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, okay? Okay. Sure. Makes sense now, but I'm still not sure using a bird call is how we want to go about this. How about we use words? But that's boring. Well, we could say something fun like, hey, there's a VBS meeting on March 6th. What if we say, come at 6 p.m. on that Wednesday and you'll learn all about VBS. And if you can't make it, see Elena Waugh. She's amazing. And if you don't know who she is, see this guy. Also, we don't just need somebody who's going to be in front of the kids. We need people behind the scenes. We need people to clean up. We need people to set up. We need people who know how to use a glue gun. That's what we're praying for. So if we could get all of those volunteers to come out and just check out VBS, come to that meeting, learn what you can do. Games is great. Kitchen duty is great. But seriously, just all hands on deck for that week. It's a special week. It could be before, after, during. You can register at TSWC.org, your children, and learn more about becoming a VBS volunteer. Can we try that? I mean, I guess we can give the boring way to try, but... Give me, give me a second. I'm gonna keep on searching. All right, that'll be the backup plan. Okay, <laughs> it's gonna work. Adrian Rogers said, it's what you sow that multiplies, not what you keep in the barn. At TSWC, we don't pass the hat, but we do believe in supporting the ministry of the church. Here's how you can give today. The box is on the walls. Text to give at 740-370-4342. On Facebook, you can hit shop now. At our website, TSWC.org, or you can swipe your card at the kiosk in the foyer. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at TSWC.org and on Facebook and Instagram at Tri-State Worship Center. Psalms 126.3 says, The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Let's worship Him this morning. Thanks again for sharing time with us this morning. Here's Pastor Terry to greet you and open with prayer. Amen. Thank you, Abby. Good job. And whoever that was looking for the birds, great job. Yeah, thank you. Let's stand. I'm going to put our prayer list up on the screen. Uh, also on our Facebook pages so that you can refer to it throughout the week. Um, there, there is an entity, a group that, that I don't know why I forgot to put them up there. We're going to have prayer with them here in just a little bit. But the group that's going to Winterfest, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, this week. Uh, they need your prayer. They need your prayer. This is a life-changing event weekend, if you will, for all of our students, as well as those that are going with them. So uh, we'll call them up and have prayer here in just a little bit, but uh, I wanted to put them on there, and, I, and somehow I spaced it. So just, if you will make a mental note, put the Winterfest gang on your prayer list. You have a special need this morning? Let me just see your hand real quick. You believe God's able? I do too. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us this time in your house. This is the day that you've made for us. Let us make the choice to rejoice and be glad in it. I pray that as we do that, you'll come and just visit this place, supply every need. Those represented on our prayer list, as well as those represented by an uplifted hand, supply every need through your riches and glory by Christ. And then let us hear some reports of victory. We pray that you'll bless those who are given the offering. God, multiply that offering for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Once again today, our request is so simple. Just let us do everything to point somebody to Jesus Christ. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for that. 
Ask it all in Christ's name. Someone shout amen. Turn around and tell somebody you're glad to see him in church this morning.
Extend your hand towards this altar area. Would you do it right now? Let's just pray for our youth group and all the leaders that are going this weekend. Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, would you just allow your spirit to hover over our young people and their leaders, over Ryan and Holly, our youth pastors. God, would you let this weekend be a life-changing weekend that's coming up for them, not just the recreation and the fun of it all and the fellowship of it all and the, and the food of it all. But Lord, as they gather there at the Lacan Arena there in Pigeon Forge, would you just let the spirit of the living God fall fresh on them. Let them come and ignite revival in South Point. I pray, Lord God, that connections will be made, friendships will be made, lifelong connections but most of all Lord God I pray that the connection with you will just be renewed reestablished reinforced whatever it needs Lord God let it happen give them safe travels and I pray Lord that we will hear testimonies of the incredibleness of God we pray this and ask it all in Christ's name everybody said amen Let's, let's give the Lord praise. Would you do it right now? Worthy of every song I could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise I could ever bring. Worthy of every breath I could ever breathe. We live for you.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say.
All right, all the kids, just for a minute, we're going to come up, hang out for just a second. I need a volunteer. Go ahead and get ready. What's your name? Piper? Come here, Piper. You're going you're gonna to help me out. Now, last week we talked about, you guys remember what we talked about? It's all around you right now. You can see it. What? What? God is light. Yes. Very first thing. Very first word spoken. God said, let there be light. And then we go to 1 John chapter 1, and it says, God is light. So everywhere you guys look and you see light, be reminded you are seeing God. It is a physical, just a physical form of us being able to be reminded every day that God is around us. Now, I told you guys that light, we see things because of light. Now, you guys, can you see the light beam coming out of my, what? Can you see, can you see the, the, the beam coming out, the light beam? Now, you can see it. You can see that, right? But can you? But if it wasn't facing you, would you know that my, this light was on if it wasn't facing you? Because light, until it's reflected, we don't really see it. For example, the, you guys ever seen Batman and they put the Batman symbol out in the sky? The reason we see Batman symbol in the sky is because it's reflecting off of clouds or dust in the air. But it has to be reflected. God's the same way. For him to be seen, God's going to reflect off of somebody. Who? Who's God going to reflect off of? Who? You. Light reflecting from you. If you look at stars in the nighttime, you see the stars because it's reflecting light. You see darkness behind them because there's nothing there reflecting it. You are light as well. It says... John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you don't have to walk in darkness. Now, Piper, I want you to cover up your eyeballs. Put them in a way where you can keep your eyeballs open, but you just can't see anything because it's real dark. Can you see anything? Uh-uh. Are your eyes open? Yes. Okay, so if there were, it was light in this little cavity, I'd be able to see the palm of my hand. But because there's no light, I can't see. Because there's no light, there's what, everybody? Darkness. Now, Piper, I want you to navigate your way through all, all of these seats out here, okay? Passing each and every person. I want you to walk out the door, and I want you to walk around the church. Can you do that? Whoa, 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 whoa. We're gonna... She was ready. Piper, are you guys, anybody... Can, could Piper do that if she can't see? What does she need in order to navigate through all of these seats and walking around the, what? Yeah. Okay, put your hand down there so you can have some light so you can see things. Remember what John 8 says. If you follow me, if you follow Jesus, you don't have to walk in darkness. The enemy will have you in the dark, not realizing that you can't see the truth. Not realizing that some of the music that you, you listen to is damaging you. Or some of the things that you're saying or some of the things you're listening to is damaging you. Or trying to keep you from, from reading God's word or keep you from praying, keep you from Sunday school. That's what darkness does. But God said, if you follow me... I'm going to light your path. Now, all of you guys have a path that you guys walk. All of you guys have steps. Walk with me a little bit, Piper. Just walk over this way. See Piper walking? You guys, each day, you're, you are going places, and you're moving, and you're growing. If you continue on in that, in that scripture where it says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. To go to Psalm 119, it says, I am the lamp to your feet and the light to your path. Look at me, guys. If you're following the Lord, your path is going to be lit up. 
You're going to know where, what to do. You're going to know where to go. You're going to make some really good decisions. On the, on the other side is darkness. Kids, allow God to light up your life. Light it up. Let him reflect off you. You surround you in your schools and on your buses and in your Sunday school rooms and at your homes. Be the light. Thank you, Piper. Everybody, let's pray for our kids. Lord, we love you. We thank you for being an awesome, awesome father. We thank you for being light. We thank you for lighting up these kids' world, lighting up their realization of who you are and how you love them and how you want to direct their paths. And you don't want them walking in darkness because if we follow you, our path is lit up. Lord, that their steps be strong, their steps be sure, their steps be seen clearly by them every single day, every single step that they take. All of their decisions, the people they talk to, Lord, light it up. These kids, that they go into their classrooms and their homes and their ball teams, that they are lit up with you because you are light. Lord, we love you. We thank you for just all of the amazing people that you have uh, set apart to minister to them, to teach them, to grow them, to parent them, to powerhouse teach them. All of, the, all of those people, thank you so much. Continue to drive their vision and drive their anointing. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone, amen. big round of applause amen. for our kids. Thank you, David. Amen. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, to get lit up, meant something. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You get a whooping. Whooping was this thing we used to get with a belt. Never mind. Saw th something floating around on social media. It had a handprint on a guy's back. You could see where he'd gotten smacked. And it was like moms from the 70s and the 80s. What are you talking about? I didn't hit you that hard. <laughs> Got a handprint on his back. So that's my mom. My mom did that, except for the handprint wasn't, as, wasn't big enough. Um, thank you for being here this morning. We appreciate that. I really appreciate you coming and spending some time with us. Uh, thank you to the praise team. We got some people that are sick, some people that were out at work. And Linda's like, you know, you don't sing that well, but if you could fill in a little bit this morning, it'd be all right. I said, okay, well, if you need me. Um, but we appreciate them leading us to the throne. And now I want to jump into our message this morning. This is uh, week eight, week eight of the question, are you being deceived? Are you being deceived? And this is the finale. This is the last one. I'm not saying I won't come up with another round of sermons because there's a whole lot more material that we could cover. But I really feel like the Lord's uh, kind of bringing it in for a landing. So if you've missed any of the first seven messages, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel and get caught up on it because there's a lot of stuff in there I think that uh, is worth watching a second, third, or even fourth time. But uh, are you being deceived. Let's pray. Lord, thank you this morning for your awesomeness. Thank you for allowing us to be in your house. I pray that as we've worshiped you, you've come and inhabited the praises of your people and that it has prepared our hearts now to hear from you. God, I pray that somehow, some way, you would just challenge us this morning. Let there be a word, a, a scripture. Let there be something that resonates in us and challenges us to set up guardrails, to set up those things that will help us to understand and discern when deception is headed our way. So help us this morning. I pray that in Christ's name, somebody say amen. amen. We've been using the Garden of Eden kind of as our stepping stone to kind of show us how cunning and how crafty the devil is. God had told Adam, listen carefully to what I'm about to say. God had told Adam, he did not tell Eve. God told Adam the rules Adam was to tell his wife the rules. Now, some of you need to make a little sticky note in your brain right now and write on there. He's coming back to that in a little bit. God told Adam, here's the rules. Adam, you tell Eve. You can eat from all the trees but one. And if you eat from that tree, you're going to die. Enter the serpent. Genesis chapter 3, start verse 2. It says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now remember, God did not say he couldn't touch it. She added to the word of God, which is a no-no. Verse 4, 
Then the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. Seed of doubt, questioning God. If God's a good God, why is he holding out on me? You won't surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you're going to be just like God, knowing good and evil. Again, it was never intended for you and I to be the arbiter, the judge of good and evil. That's only led to problems because what I consider good, Kim may not consider good. What I consider bad, God may not consider bad. He was supposed to be the judge of what's good and bad, not us. But since we have become the judge of what's good and bad, it's really taken a turn for the worse. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. We've covered a prep course on what deception is. We've looked at the pathology, the study of lies. The devil is the father of all lies. If he's speaking, he's lying. Listen to me. Nothing he says is true. And then a couple weeks ago, we turned the corner, started looking at the devil's strategies on how he, he comes against us, how he tries to deceive us. And now I want to take a look at the indictments against Adam and Eve and the serpent for their disobedience. So if you take your finger from Genesis chapter 3 and just slide down there to verse 14, I'm going to pick up the narrative there. It says, Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done all this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. You'll crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And then he, God said to the woman, Eve, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Remember the sticky note? We're there. We're there. God, listen to me, God has a master design for marriage that has incredible, incredible benefits, that has incredible purpose. And we, in the world that we live in, have moved so far away from his design, it doesn't even look like marriage anymore. He has, now listen, before you cast judgment on me, I'm not a chauvinist pig. I don't try to rule over my wife like an ogre. But there is a design. There is a plan for how marriage is supposed to work. It's God's design. Remember when I said God told Adam the rules, and then Adam was supposed to tell his wife. We live in a culture, though, that's far removed from that beauty and from that brilliance. We live in a culture that has somehow moved away from God's plan. And we, as fallen people, we might initially balk at what some refer to as male headship and believe that it means that somehow, some way, women are not equal. That's not what it says, and that's not what it means. But the world wants you to think that so that we won't submit ourselves to the plan of God. We, as a society, have moved away from God's plan and God's purpose And in God's eyes, his design is, listen, his design is, yes, husband and wives have equal value, but they have different roles and different responsibilities. And we've moved away from that. And you can get mad at me if you want. Last time I even mentioned male headship in a message, I got people visiting my office the next week. So call Jake and make an appointment. Let me just ease into this just a little bit. Let me just poke on you just a little bit, and then we'll move on. The Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. I know you thought your name was in there. <laughs> the head of every man is, put your name in. No, the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Seems simple, but we don't like it. And if we don't like it, it must not be true. Because it don't make me feel good, it must not be true. 
Paul, again, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife. As also, Christ. man, I can feel you getting mad at me right now. Just hang on. Hang on. The husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Sticky note. When we knowingly rebel against the word of God, it's going to have consequences. When we knowingly don't do what the Bible says, there's going to be consequences. Can we be forgiven? Of course. Mercy and grace available? Of course. Does it mean it removes consequences? No. I'm going to say this, and you, if you're not mad at me yet, you'll get mad at me now. There's a lot of families that are struggling, struggling to find the victory. And the reason that you can't seem to overcome is because you're living in rebellion. If a husband loves his, oh, let's see, I get, you get like one amen or come on, and then that was it. Everybody's like, huh, I ain't going there with him. Forget it. If a husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church, even to laying his life down for her, a woman's not going to have a problem submitting to that. So the problem really starts with the men. Learning how to love your wife is, <laughs> we got a big amen on that one. Yeah. I'm going to have Tyler edit this before. We, we had an internet problem. I don't know if you knew that. We could, or we're not being live streamed right now. So I'm going to have Tyler edit that part out. If a husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church, even laying his life down for her, what woman would not submit to that? Why do I submit to Christ? I submit to Christ because I know how much he loved me. He loved me so much he laid his life down for me. So I got no problem submitting to that because I know he loves me. The husband's headship, now we're going to move on, okay? We're going to move on because I can feel the tension in the air. The husband's headship did not start in the New Testament. It didn't start in the Old Testament. It didn't start at the fall. Listen to me. If you think male headship started at the fall, you're always going to view it as a curse. And you're never one going to submit to that because you think that's a curse. No, male headship started when God started creation. He created man from the dust of the earth. I know that some of you just, just don't want to hear that. But the truth is the truth. And, and the problem is when I say God has a beautiful design for marriage, it begins with male headship. Men need to be the priest of their home. There's a lot of people in your mind, the enemy's already said, that's not right. That's just not true. You've come a long way, baby. Some of you ain't old enough to remember that. And I was thinking about it, by the way. My, it was 1985 was my first trip to Winterfest, not 82. So I'm three years younger than you thought I was. Verse 17, moving on. And to the man, he, God said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to, uh, to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Now, just look real quickly with me. God's judgment on the serpent is really in what accounts for what we think of snakes today. Most normal people, not including my daughter-in-law because she loves snakes, most normal, most normal snakes is like, whoa, 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 get that away from me. I don't know if that's what Sammy was doing on the little skit, if he was up there on the hill and he was looking and he looked and he jumped. I don't know if he was supposed to be seeing a snake, but that's normally what we do. And that goes all the way back to the fall. What we see there is what God spoke in the garden. But then we see something when he pronounces judgment on the woman that really is a picture of the gospel, really a picture of the gospel. Biologically, listen to me, biologically, a woman does not have a seed. That's why, that's why men are necessary for the two to become one, because biologically, the woman does not have seed. And in this judgment, God is foretelling a virgin birth. What, what does it say? The seed of a woman will ultimately be victorious over the plans of the enemy. 
but a woman doesn't have seed, so it must be a virgin birth. And all of this is due to disobedience. Disobedience. Don't eat the fruit. She ate it, gave it to her husband. And as much as we're thankful for medications, it's still painful to have a baby. Now, I've never had a baby, but I've watched my wife go through two births, and it's, it's not comfortable. Yeah, I mean, they can do all the epidurals and all the different things, and it's still a painful, painful thing. And the dominance of a wife over her husband is a constant struggle for balance. And God knew that. But he has a plan. Adam receives the longest and the harshest judgment of all. Because of his disobedience, because of him disobeying the Lord, he's got to work twice as hard to see the result of his effort. He's got to work twice as hard to see the fruit of his labor. Not only that, while Eve's pain is in childbirth, Adam's pain is in toiling the ground. And in toiling the ground, that ground is cursed. That's what God said. That ground's going to be cursed. You're going to have to work twice as hard to try to get anything out from the ground. You're going to eat from it, but it's going to take you twice as much work to produce anything. The ground's going to produce some thorns. It's going to produce some thistles. You're going to toil. Watch. You're going to toil, and then you're going to die. Why do we struggle at funerals, because you and I were never intended to understand this thing called death. We were created to live forever. So we get to a funeral, and it's hard, because we don't understand that. We weren't created to understand that. That's God's plan. And suddenly, Adam is told, you're going to toil, and then you're going to die, and because of this last judgment... Somebody get ready to shout. Because of this last judgment, that's why Christ came to earth. So that you and I would not die in our sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. You and I don't have to die in our sin. We can be reconciled. We can be restored into right relationship with the Father because of what Jesus did. We're going to celebrate that in about five weeks, the, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he did that so that we don't have to die in our sins. So God removes Adam and Eve from the garden. He takes them to a place that's foreign to them, that's strange to them, and he tells them they can never come back. Think about that. They had to live in a foreign, strange place knowing they could never go back. Let me, let me tell you something. Listen, what made it bearable was that they lived knowing that they had mercy applied to their life. Now, I'm saying that to say this. God will forgive us of sin. God will apply mercy and grace to our life, but there's going to be consequences to the sin. There's going to be consequences to us disobeying God. Adam and Eve had consequences. They could no longer live in the perfect place created by a perfect God for the perfect couple. Now they're going to live in a strange and foreign place, but they're going to go there knowing that mercy has been applied. And to, to spare them from future shame and future guilt, what God does, and this is so cool, he, he removes their attempt at self-righteousness, their fig leaves, he kills an animal. He takes the fur of the animal. Now, if it was me, I, I would throw that at my children. Put that on and get out of here. That's not what God did. The Bible tells us that God clothed them. Mercy. He took their insufficient attempt to cover what they had done wrong, and he covered it with an animal skin. As a matter of fact, it's the first recorded part of the Bible where we read the shedding of blood for sin. The animal had to die. The animal's blood had to be shed so that Adam and Eve could be covered. And you and I need to understand that Adam and Eve could not be judged. If they were not judged, they could not receive the mercy. And you and I need to understand that if we're not judged, we can't receive mercy. 
If we don't get to a point where the conviction of the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of us and says, listen, that's wrong. We can never receive mercy for that. We can't receive Christ until we recognize that we're sinners, that we're separated from God. And we receive Christ and he restores us. He reconciles us back into right relationship because of his sacrifice. And all of that from the garden to this point, all of that was based on disobedience. God said, don't. The devil said, try. And they disobeyed. Flip Wilson had it wrong. The devil can't make you do anything. When we do it, we do it of our own accord, of our own volition, of our own will. And just so that we see how God sees this rebellion, just so that we can get a, a, just a small snapshot of what God thinks, let's go to the story of Israel's first king, Saul. Israel's crying out, we want a king. God said, I want to be your king. Israel said, we want a king like everybody else got a king. God said, okay. And you can go back and read the history. That was the beginning of the end. Sometimes God answers prayers he don't want to answer. You think because he answered it that it must be the right thing. It's like the guy who wanted to quit eating donuts. Lord, if you want me to quit eating donuts, don't let there be a parking place in front of the donut shop. And on his fifth time around, he found a spot, and he just knew that the Lord wanted him to get a donut. The first king is Saul. The end of his reign as king is ushered in by rebellion, disobedience. God had given him some specific plans, some specific instruction, and he disobeyed. And instead of Saul confessing what he had done, he stands his ground. And the prophet Samuel goes to him. And tells him, listen, God's going to take the kingdom from you. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Just a few verses. Start at verse 18. The Lord sent you, uh, Saul, on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? Listen to Saul's response. But I did obey the Lord. I carried out the mission that he gave me. I brought back King Agag. Now, he just lied right there. I did destroy everybody, but I brought back the king. I obeyed the Lord, except for this little thing over here. But I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and the plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. I didn't obey the Lord, but I kept some of this stuff because I'm going to give it to the Lord. And it's going to be okay. But Samuel, the prophet, replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission... A cuss word in our culture today. Submission. Submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. And stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That's how God sees disobedience. That's how God sees rebellion. Because disobedience is rebelling against the things that we know God has told us to do. Think about that. When we hear in our culture today, we hear the word witchcraft, we think of what? Seances, divination, Ouija boards, other rituals, spirit-threatening practices. We hear the word witchcraft and we have this vivid image of evil, wicked, nasty things. But rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. And stubbornness is bad as worshiping idols. You see, Adam and Eve, like Saul, they, they started out on the right track. They started out being obedient to the Lord. They started out listening to God. But disobedience and deception crept in 
And suddenly they find themselves doing the opposite of what God said to do. In both cases. And the problem, the result, is that it disqualified both of them. Adam and Eve are kicked out of a familiar place to go to a strange place. King Saul has the kingdom taken away from him because of his rebellion. I say all that to say this. God is more interested in your character than he is your comfort. Matter of fact, sometimes he makes us uncomfortable to help develop our character. And sometimes we don't see those weaknesses. Sometimes we don't see those character flaws until we're under pressure. Right? So we say, impatience. I'm not impatient. Yet you try to get from the stoplight at the 17th Street Bridge to the bridge within 10 seconds. And if anybody gets in your way, you suddenly become impatient. What about pride? Pride is revealed in us when we are asked to do something that seems below us. Oh, uh, uh, no. Can you, uh, can you set up some tables? Well, let me pray about it. No, I, I just need to set up tables. Oh, that's, that's, you know, you want me to teach a class? No, I want to see your servant's heart first. Oh, boy. Man, the male headship thing didn't go over well. Now, this, this pride thing is going over well. Stubbornness. What about stubbornness? might be revealed when you're commanded to do something that you don't want to do. I got real quiet, didn't it? Immaturity. Immaturity is going to be... I've been talking to them for a while. I'm going to come over and talk to you. Immaturity is revealed... Listen, when I'm asked to do something I don't want to do. Immaturity is revealed when I'm asked to do something that doesn't make me feel good. Immaturity may be revealed when I realize I can't have my way. What about self-will? It can be revealed when we're required to do something that doesn't align with our personal ambition. Can you help me set up some tables? Well, I was really hoping you would ask me to preach. Because that is what's on my mind. What about self-centeredness? It can be revealed when we have to serve some other people that we really don't like. What about idolatry? It might be revealed when we're asked to give up something that has deep meaning to us. And the simple definition of idolatry is anything that lessens my affection towards God is idolatry. Sometimes it's something and sometimes it's someone. So every one of these characteristics is part of our character. And sometimes God's trying to form character and develop character and help us with our character rather than to just get us through something. And sometimes he doesn't mind making us uncomfortable so that that character can be developed so that in that character we can recognize and discern when the enemy is trying to do something tricky. Satan knows how God feels about rebellion. You think Satan doesn't know? Of course he knows how God feels about rebellion. God hates it. He hates it. But because of this, you and I have to make sure that rebellion doesn't rule our hearts. Well, I'm not rebellious. Satan is persuasive. As a matter of fact, he will take what is perceived truth, what God has to say, and he will turn it into damnable lies. And people believe it. People go for it. I, I don't understand it. When I was growing up, somebody said, that's bad. That meant, that's bad. Don't do that. If you say that today, it means that's good. That's bad. That's good. No, I, I get confused. Take that microcosm into the macrocosm. That's the way our world is. It's upside down. It's just backward. And that's the art of deception, taking the truth 
turning it on its head. And that's what this whole series has been about. Are you being deceived? Is it possible that you once stood in favor and believed and was, had a conviction that this is what God said, that suddenly you're not so sure anymore? And if that's the case, could it be that the enemy has introduced something there that you should have probably walked away from? Again, Eve's biggest problem was she should have stopped the conversation. She should have just ended it. But no, she just kept on going. And suddenly we find what was supposed to damage our soul now becomes believable. What's going to damage our eternity becomes something that we might think, oh, you know what, that might have some truth to it. And every time that we believe a lie, we make it harder and harder on ourselves than to find our way back to truth. It's like an onion. You just have to keep peeling and keep peeling and keep peeling it. So here we are at the end of an eight-week series asking the question, are you being deceived? And now I want to give you just a few preventative measures before we pray. In an hour. There, there are some steps we can take to recognize when the devil's doing his thing. First, remember this. Satan always strikes when we are most vulnerable. Remember a couple weeks ago we used that acrostic halt. When you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. That, the devil's coming at you when you are least expecting it and when you are most vulnerable. And when we become vulnerable, man, I hope somebody hears this. When we find ourselves at that place when we are hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or something else that's making us vulnerable, in those moments, we find ourselves stepping away from and further away from our relationship with God. Usually when we find ourselves in those seasons, we will isolate ourselves. I saw this floating around this week. It simply says this, the sheep that gets picked off by the wolf is always the one who has distanced himself from the shepherd. Always. Secondly, be aware that the enemy speaks through other people. If the devil can't get to you, he will get to you through somebody who's close to you. Be careful who you have around you. Be careful of the friendships that you have. Jesus has just announced to the disciples he's going to die. He's going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill him. He'll be buried, but in three days he's going to raise. And what does Simon Peter say? Not as long as I'm alive, Lord, you'll live forever. I mean, again, I can't imagine saying that to Jesus. And instead of Jesus grabbing a hold of Simon Peter and saying, Thank you, man. Thank you for being on my side. Thank you for loving me like that. What did he say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Simon Peter like, no, 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 Simon Peter. And Jesus says in Matthew 16, 23, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You, Simon Peter, are a dangerous trap to Jesus. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Again, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Simon Peter saw it as a bad thing. We should all be seeing it as a good thing. And God saw it as a good thing. And because Simon Peter stood up and said, no, 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 no. Jesus said, listen, get away from me, Satan. Thirdly, when God speaks a specific word, know that Satan also has a strategy and will encourage us to disobey whatever that word is. Now, this is not a message on giving, but the best example I can give you is on giving. The Lord challenges you, speaks to you, and says, give everything that's in your pocket. And your first thought is, I can't do that. First thought, from God. Second thought, not from God. Fourth, examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Somehow identify those things that are in our heart 
that Satan could draw strength from. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Learn how God wants to wants us to respond to those things. In some instances, he wants us to be silent. In some instances, he wants us to say something, to be vocal. When Pilate asked Jesus to defend himself, to plead his case, Jesus maintained his silence. Should I tell him that? No. Yeah, I'm going to tell him. Sometimes people think better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> Sometimes we just got to know when to be quiet. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. You don't have enough to give. Keep it. <laughs> keep what you got. And then here's maybe the greatest measure. Linda, if you'll come. Here's the greatest measure to prevent deception. We find it in James chapter 4. Verse 7. Here it is. Ready? Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I've told you for years, when you see the word therefore in the Bible, you should ask what it's there for. So you find the reason it's there in the first or the two verses before that, verse 5 and 6. Here's what it says, James chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Do you think that the scriptures say in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then it goes on to say, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, he will flee. The problem is, is we got some people trying to resist the devil that haven't done verse 4 and 5. Haven't done verse 6. Haven't humbled themselves. Well, I've been praying about that. Quit praying about humility. It's a decision of the will to be humble. Why is submission so hard for us? Why is it so hard? I had, somebody, I had a couple come to me, want me to do their wedding ceremony. Began the premarital counseling. I require three meetings. In the first meeting... The bride informs me that as part of the ceremony, she did not want that submission thing in there. That's exactly how she said. I don't want that submission thing in there. I said, it's in the Bible. I, she said, I don't want it in there. I said, well, I can't do your wedding. And I didn't. I didn't, do, I didn't do their wedding. You can't leave out what God said is in. That's, again, that's beginning this whole pathway to rebellion. And so the question becomes, why is submission such a difficult thing for us? And I'm going to give you the easy answer. Are you ready? Look at your neighbor and say, he's getting ready to give us the answer. Why is submission so difficult for us? And here's why. Because it is a product of the will. See, we think we can just pray and fast for seven days and somehow submission is going to fall out of the sky and just hit us. Oh, now I'm submissive. I wasn't submissive before, but now all of a sudden I am. Nope. I have to decide. I'm going to submit to that. I'll submit to that. I'll submit to that. And when I'm in right relationship with the Lord, I submit to Him. And I follow all of His commands. All of His commands. And when we find ourselves totally submitted to the Father... There's just certain things we just don't entertain anymore. We just don't entertain them. The devil knows for most believers, he's not going to convince you to go kill somebody. Not going to convince you to steal something. Although, he's not going to convince you to do those really like gross things that we talk. But you know why? He just start with a little seed of doubt. Just a little seed of doubt that can sprout into something. And when we're submitted totally to the will of God, the word of God, the plan, the purpose of God, we just don't entertain certain things. Some, some people defend their actions by what they refer to as white lies. I don't know what the difference between a white lie and a lie is. 
Because in my book, a lie is a lie. And there was a time in my life when I, I, just, I, wasn't, I wasn't as honest as I could have been. And that, that wore me out. I just got tired because I couldn't remember what I said to that person. <laughs> you know, and then you got to go back and try to say it the second, third, fourth time. You, don't, you just don't remember. There's just certain things when we're totally submitted to God that we just don't entertain anymore. Just be real. Be genuine. Be authentic. Be transparent. Be you. Ephesians chapter 4, here's what Paul says. It's really simple. Don't give place to the devil. Now he, I'm sure there's principle and precept in there somewhere that would, would kind of lead us to do a lot of prayer and Bible reading and fasting. And, but that's a decision of, of, of the will. That's a decision. Of, just don't give a place to the devil. Get away from the people and the places where the things are going on that are a weakness to you. I stood on a, a, a door porch or the front porch of somebody who was uh, addicted to drugs. Crack cocaine was their drug of choice. They started, started trying to get their life straightened up. They called me one day. I was actually on my way to Columbus to get Holly. Uh, some of you might remember Paul and Kelly Copley just right down the road here. When they, when they died, Holly was in Washington, D.C. She flew in uh, to go to the funeral. I was on my way up there, and I get this phone call. And this, this person that I've been working with trying to help them see the way. I'm sorry, Linda. You might have to play an extra minute. Um, he, he says, listen, I, I, I was in the hood, and there was a guy come out of a house, and he was bleeding. And he said, I looked at him. I said, man, you want us to take you to the hospital? And the guy said, yes, please. So got out of the car, lifted up the seat, let the guy get in. They get, he said, I got two blocks down the road. And the guy said, let me out. Just let me out. Just let me out. So my friend gets out, opens the door. And when the guy gets out, he punches my friend right in the nose. Punches him in the nose. Well, sometimes the autonomic response, when you get punched in the nose, you punch back. That's what my friend did. When he did that, there were about four guys that come walking out of a house that all of a sudden think that my friend is beating up this guy who's all bloody. And they come and beat my friend up. Now, I said all that to say, my friend says, what did I do wrong? I said, you were in the hood. People and places, right? Stay away from the people and places. Listen, get yourself in a spot where you don't even entertain what the devil wants you to entertain. Don't give place to the devil. Here's the last scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. He Unequivocally, he tells us, stand firm against the devil and be strong in your faith. Stand firm against the devil and be strong in your faith. Don't give in to every little whim that comes along just because you're not, it's not going to make you look good. Well, if I stand against this that God's against, it's not going to make me look good. So What? The absolute worst thing that can happen to me, I'm going to close my eyes here and open them in heaven. Not a bad deal. Let's stand. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, helping us to understand that the devil is a sly old fox. He is crafty. He is cunning. He can make what is bad look good. He can make what is untrue look true. He can lead us to a path of rebellion. And our defense against that, Lord God, is to find ourselves in a relationship with you that brings us to a point where we don't entertain those things anymore. We just simply ask you, Lord, what do you want us to do here? What should we do here? And God, if we're in a right relationship with you, you'll, you'll show us, you'll speak to us, whether it be through your word, through somebody, through a, an instance, through a happen, happening. Whatever it is, Lord, you'll show us. I know you will. You've done it for me. So I pray, Lord, that we can somehow become sensitive to your voice. Learn your voice and learn to discern so that we don't fall victim to the deception of the enemy. We thank you for that. I ask it in Christ's name. Keep your heads bowed for just a moment. If you're here this morning and you're not in a right relationship with Christ, you have already heard the voice of deception. The voice of deception is telling you it's okay. You're all right. Hang on for a few minutes. He'll be quiet. We'll go home. Everything will be fine. 
That is the enemy because he hates everything that God loves. So if you're here this morning, you're not in a right relationship with Christ. You can be. But again, it's a, a decision of your will to do it. So if that's you, I would love to pray with you. But the, pr- the prayer is not salvation. The prayer is just putting voice to the decision of your heart. So we're going to sing this chorus through just a couple times. And as we sing it, if that's you, you're not in a right relationship with Christ, but you want to be, I would love to pray with you. Would you come? Let's all sing it together. Holy, holy, there's no one. Show me who you are. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I love you. I do. Now, you may not believe it, but I really do. And, and I want us to be on guard against the enemy because he's so slick. Man, he's so slick. And I've seen just too many friends, too many believers that just weren't on guard. They just weren't on guard. And they got caught by that jab that just knocked them out. And we need to be on guard. So I pray that over the last eight weeks, just some information, some weapon, some tool that you can use to stand against the devil, to resist him, to not make place for him and walk in the ways of God. I love you. I appreciate you being here tonight at 6 o'clock. Don't forget our men's Bible study. See you next time.